All right, last time we took a look at utilitarianism. Schaefer Landau presented the utilitarian thesis and then pre presented some reasons for finding utilitarianism to be a plausible normative theory, uh, reasons for thinking that it's the correct normative theory. Now let's take a look at some arguments on the other side. Let's take a look at some arguments against utilitarianism. Uh, the title of this chapter is Consequentialism, Its Difficulties. So last time we looked at consequentialism, its nature and attractions. And as I said last time, or just as I pointed out last time, Schaefer Landau points out that consequentialism is a broad term that is simply re uh, refers to any normative theory according to which the rightness or, or wrongness of an action is determined by its consequences. So that's a broad position. And then uh, after he says that, he goes on to say, but I'm just going to focus on util one version of consequentialism, namely utilitarianism. And so that was the version of consequentialism that we discussed last time. And again, the utilitarian thesis is that the right act is the act that maximizes good consequences, where... <clears throat> good is understood as tending to promote pleasure or happiness, or the act that minimizes bad consequences, where bad is understood as tending to produce pain or unhappiness. So that's the consequentialist, I'm sorry, that's the utilitarian uh, thesis about right and wrong. And we looked at some considerations last time that make it seem plausible, but let's take a look at some criticisms of the view now. Let's take a look at the difficulties for the utilitarian view. <clears throat> One problem f that for utilitarianism that Schaefer Landau discusses has to do with the status of certain morally right acts. Um, some morally right acts are super arrogatory. So a problem for consequentialism is this problem of supererogation. As Schaefer Landau points out, utilitarianism conflicts with the common moral belief that some acts are supererogatory. That is to say, they're praiseworthy and they're admirable, but they're not obligatory. That is to say, they're not required. Um, for example, giving up your life to save the lives of two strangers. That might be a, a heroic act, but it's not morally required. It's beyond what morality requires of us. Some praiseworthy acts are beyond what morality requires of us. And since this, but since this act would maximize good consequences, excuse me, maximize good consequences, utilitarianism makes it obligatory rather than supererogatory. Okay, so this is a problem for the utilitarian view. It doesn't recognize what I would call our common sense moral belief that some morally praiseworthy acts are not required. They're, they're super arrogatory. So in ethics, there are a few distinctions that we make uh, among different categories of action. The most important distinction for moral philosophy when it comes to acts, when it comes to actions that moral agents perform, would be the distinction between right and wrong. But within right acts, there are a few different things that you could mean by that. Within right acts, we sometimes distinguish between obligatory acts, that is to say, acts that are morally right and are required, and on the other hand, morally right acts that are optional. They're morally right, but, th but they're not required. Um, now, on most views, for example, telling the truth is obligatory. <clears throat> it's a morally right act that you are required to do. And then some morally right acts um, are optional. There are a couple of reasons why, why a morally right act might be optional. Now, when I say morally right here, what I mean is morally permissible, that is to say, an act that is allowed by morality. Now again, some acts may be permissible, that is, that is to say they may be allowed by morality because they're obligatory, they're required. So to tell the truth is morally permissible because it's required. 
And then there are some acts that are morally permissible, and that is to say they're allowed by morality. But they're not required, they're optional. Now there are a couple of reasons why an, a morally permissible act might be optional. <clears throat> a morally right act might be optional because it's morally neutral. It doesn't impinge on morality. It doesn't touch on issues of right and wrong in any deep way, in any significant way. So some permissible acts are optional because they're morally neutral. So for example, whether you tie your left shoe first or your right shoe first doesn't impinge, it doesn't touch in any way on issues of right and wrong. It is certainly morally permissible to tie your left shoe first. It is morally permissible in the sense that there's nothing morally wrong with doing that, but it's optional, right? It's not something that, you're, that morality requires you to do. You may tie your left shoe first if that's what you want to do, but morality doesn't require you to do that. It allows you to do that. So we say that this is an example of a permissible act that's optional because it's morally neutral. It doesn't touch in any way on issues of right and wrong. But then some acts that are morally permissible that is to say allowable, allowed by morality, are optional rather than required, not because they're morally neutral, not because they don't have a connection, uh, an important connection to right and wrong, but because they're super arrogatory, because they're optional because they're way more than morality requires. So one example would here again be giving up your life to save the lives of two strangers. Does morality, does morality require you to do that? It might be praiseworthy, it might be admirable, it might be morally heroic. <clears throat> but I think most people believe that it's not morally required. You're not required to give up your life to save the lives of two strangers. Or to take a bullet to save the life of a stranger, for example. That might be heroic, but here again, it's super arrogatory. It's beyond what morality requires. Schaefer Landau gives the example on page 147 of a bystander dashing into a burning building in order to rescue strangers trapped inside. Okay, here again, um, that is a very admirable, very praiseworthy, uh, a heroic thing to do, but I think most people believe that that is not required by morality. It's not obligatory. It's admirable, praiseworthy, but it's super arrogatory. It's beyond what morality requires of you. Okay, so that's just a, a bit of moral common sense. I think most people do believe that there are some acts that are, um, here again, of, of high moral value, but not required, way beyond what morality requires of us, not, not obligatory. Those would be super arrogatory acts. <clears throat> Well, here again, acts that are not required would be optional, and then there are two reasons, and that could be optional. It might just be morally neutral, but then there's this category of super arrogatory acts, acts that do have a very strong connection to the right, to what is right to do, because they're so morally outstanding, they're so morally um, praiseworthy, but they are beyond what morality requires. <clears throat> now, again, the problem for utilitarianism is that such an act, though, might maximize good consequences. It is arguably the case that giving up your life to save the lives of two strangers maximizes good consequences, right? One life would be lost, namely yours, and that's a bad consequence, but two lives would be saved. Those are two good consequences. So, in that case, the good consequences outweigh the bad consequences. So the utilitarian has to say that that act is required, not super arrogatory. But I think most people believe you're not required to give up your life to save the lives of two strangers. That seems, if you want to, maybe that's heroic, but morality doesn't demand it of us, doesn't require it of us. If you want to do that, that's super arrogatory. Or at least that seems like moral common sense, but again, the utilitarian has to deny that. The utilitarian has to say, no, that's required. As Schaefer Landau puts it on 147, utilitarians must deny that this is a case of super arrogation because they deny that any actions are above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, our moral duty is to do the very best we can. If among all the options available to you at the time, dashing into the building is going to minimize harm, then this is what you must do. 
It's not optional. It's your duty. Okay. Well, that seems to conflict with our common sense moral intuition that that is not required. That is super arrogatory. So I said last time that in a lot of ways it seems like utilitarianism does match up pretty well with our common sense moral beliefs, but there are also many cases in which it seems to conflict with our common sense moral beliefs, and these are reasons for doubting that it is the correct normative theory. Uh, giving up your life to save the lives of two strangers, taking a bullet um, to save the lives of innocent people, uh, running into a burning building to save the lives of strangers here. Again, all these may be praiseworthy, admirable, heroic, morally outstanding, but I think most people believe that they're not required. Morality doesn't require you to, set, to uh, give up your life. If you want to make that sacrifice, that's morally, uh, here again, outstanding, but it's super arrogatory. It's beyond what morality requires. Again, utilitarians have to deny that such acts are super arrogatory if they will maximize good consequences. So utilitarianism does seem to conflict with moral common sense in these kinds of cases. Another problem for utilitarianism that Schaefer Landau discuss, discusses is this issue of impartiality. I said last time that it seemed like, at least at first glance, it seemed like utilitarians' emphasis on impartiality was a strength, right? Because we wouldn't accept a moral principle that allowed one kind of act to one group of people, but then said it was wrong for another group of people, say, for example, on the basis of race or on the basis of sex or on the basis of religion. Um, we wouldn't think it's an acceptable, uh, an acceptable moral principle it would be an acceptable moral principle if some principle said that it is morally permissible for members of religion X and Y to do something, but members of religion Z may not do that because they are members uh, of this unpopular religious minority or something like that, right? Um, we wouldn't think that that's an acceptable moral principle, and you could say the same for differences between races or differences between the sexes. It seems like at first glance, impartiality is part of the moral point of view. Just uh, adopting the moral point of view on things, everybody's, e everybody's interests ought to be given equal consideration. So from the moral point of view, it does seem like everyone's interests ought to be considered excuse me, impartially. Thus, utilitarianism's strict impartiality has seemed appealing to many. But our duties seem to require partiality, at least some of the time. For example, it seems that I ought to be more focused on the well-being of my children than someone else's. It seems that I ought to give more attention to the well-being of family, friends, and neighbors than to people on the other side of the world. Um, it's more likely, for one thing, that I can actually be of some good I mean, it's just more efficient to try to help those who are closer to you. It's more likely that I can be of some good to people who are in a relatively close connection um, to me. But utilitarians have to deny that. Utilitarians have to say that the fact that someone is your friend or your neighbor or a member of your family uh, makes no difference. Because here again, utilitarianism requires a strict impartiality. And when you start to think about it a little bit more, what, what seems like a, a, a positive of the view at first glance uh, may turn out to be a weakness of the view when you start to think about it a little bit more. It seems like some of our duties do require that we be partial, do require a certain amount of partiality. So Schaefer Landau gives this example on page 148. <clears throat> it seems right to translate my care uh, into action. If I have saved a bit of money, and it could either pay for my son's minor surgery or relieve the greater suffering of famine victims, most of us will think it at least permissible to pay the surgeon. But to do that is to be partial to the interests of my son. Utilitarianism, utilitarianism does not allow that. It rejects the idea that a person just because he is my son, friend, fellow citizen is more, des more deserving of my help and attention. So what would you do in, in what would you do in that? 
circumstance. Your son needs minor surgery. He won't die without it, but he does need it, let's say. But the money that you could use on getting your son that minor surgery could also be used to save the life of someone in danger of dying from famine on the other side of the world. Okay, so in that case, what would you do? Well, here again, I think most people, as, as Schaefer Landau says here, I think most people believe that it is morally permissible to take care of your son. <clears throat> I think most people believe that it is morally permissible to attach more importance to your duty to your children than it is to the moral obligation to help people on the other side of the world. Maybe, maybe to try to do both if you can is a duty. But it seems like um, our duties to our children, our duties to our family members, and here again, friends and neighbors, um, it seems like they are the more pressing duties. There, there may be a general duty to try to help others as well, but it seems like people are justified in focusing their energy and their attention on helping out those who are relatively closely connected to them. That simply seems like a bit of moral common sense. <clears throat> but here again, utilitarianism says that's not morally permissible. You may not uh, attach more importance to your duty to your own children than to anyone else in the world. Everybody has to, everybody's interests, everybody's well-being has to be considered exactly equally in a strictly impartial calculation of good and bad consequences. That's what utilitarianism says, but I don't think too many people would really be willing um, to do that. And perhaps they're justified in thinking that, here again, their duties to their children come first. Our duties to our own family members are, here again, they have to take priority. I think most people believe that that is morally permissible, that, that is, there's nothing morally wrong with that. Uh, utilitarianism says there is something wrong with that, so that's a real reason to wonder whether utilitarianism is the correct normative theory. <clears throat> As Schaefer Landau points out, nothing is intrinsically wrong on the utilitarian view, as, as we've seen. Here again, the utilitarian, the principle of utility is that the right act is the one that maximizes good consequences. So no act is absolutely prohibited. If it will maximize good consequences, then it's justified. That is the utilitarian view. There is no intrinsic wrongness or rightness. It's never the case that an act is just by its very nature somehow wrong or right. But here again, I think that conflicts with uh, a common moral belief. It seems like many of us have a common sense moral belief to the effect that some acts are just by their very nature wrong. And even if you could bring about a lot of good consequences by doing them, you still wouldn't do them because there's just something in the nature of the act um, that makes it bad. And you could say the same thing about rightness. It seems like some ways of acting just are intrinsically good. And even if they ended up in any particular case not having any good consequences, you would still think it was a morally good thing to do. Um, so utilitarianism conflicts with the common moral belief that some kinds of acts, for example, torture, enslavement, rape, are by their very nature wrong. In any case in which such an act would maximize good consequences, utilitarianism prescribes that we perform that act. It requires us to perform that act. <clears throat> But I think a lot of people would say, no, with respect to some acts, there just is something in the nature of the act that makes it bad, and I wouldn't do it, even if by doing it, I could maximize good consequences. <clears throat> Schaefer Landau <clears throat> gives this example on page 150. He says, imagine a person who is really badly off and whose future is grim. He wants to live and enjoys some small pleasures every now and then, but most of his life is quite bad, and that's not going to change. The world would contain less misery if he were to die. 
and so we must kill him, provided, of course, that we avoid causing even greater harm by doing so. If we were caught, then we would be sent to jail, our own families would suffer, other vulnerable people would become much more afraid, and so on. But if we can kill this man without being caught, while convincing everyone that he died of natural causes, then utilitarianism tells us that is what we must do. Okay, so I think most of us would not do that because we just believe that there is something intrinsically wrong with killing an innocent human being. Now, here again, utilitarianism requires us to do whatever will maximize good consequences. And here again, on the utilitarian view, good is just understood as tending to promote pleasure or happiness. Well, it would tend to promote pleasure or happiness if this miserable person who seems to have no chance um, of ever not being miserable, if he just weren't in the if he just weren't in the world, there would be more happiness in the world. That is true. And yet, I think most of us uh, would not kill an innocent person just to increase the amount of happiness in the world. Uh, maybe you would. You'll have to decide for yourself what to what to think about that. But the fact that here again, many of us have a common sense moral belief to the effect that it's intrinsically wrong to kill an innocent person, and we wouldn't do it, even if we could increase the amount of happiness in the world by doing that. Uh, I think uh, a lot of us have a stronger conviction that that common sense moral belief is true than our belief, than, than any belief that we could have in the principle of utility, in, in utilitarianism. Utilitarianism here again in this case just does seem to conflict with our common sense moral intuition, our common sense moral belief. I think a lot of us think that there are some acts that might increase the amount of happiness in the world, but we still wouldn't do them because there just is something in the nature of the act that makes it bad. There just is intrinsic wrongness to certain kinds of action, such as killing an innocent person. All right, another problem for consequentialism that Schaefer Landau presents is what he calls the problem of injustice. In any case in which we could maximize good consequences by violating someone's rights, utilitarianism requires that we do so. For example, taking from a minority and giving to the majority would make more people happy, but that conflicts with a common moral belief that to do so would be wrong. So that would be one kind of example. What would be another kind of example? <clears throat> On page uh, 151, uh, Fundamentals. Schaefer Landau writes, um, <clears throat> kind of in the middle of the page, uh, you might stop terrorists from their dirty work by abducting their relatives and threatening to torture them. Okay, so that's one kind of example. Suppose it's a ticking bomb scenario. <clears throat> You're a CIA officer and you have uh, a terrorist detained and the terrorist knows where the bomb is. It's somewhere in New York City, and when it goes off, millions of people are going to die. <clears throat> so it's this ticking bomb scenario. And because you're the CI officer who's been working on the case, and you've done all the psychological profiling of this terrorist, um, you know that torturing this terrorist will not compel him to reveal the location of the bomb. Um, however, you also have, let's say, his three-year-old son in custody. And you do know, and suppose you're connected connected to the terrorist by Skype, some video conference, something like that, and he can see that you uh, have his three-year-old son. Uh, and, you, and you do know, because you've done all the psychological profiling, profiling on the case, that if you start torturing his three-year-old son, who of course is innocent, has not done anything wrong, um, that will compel him to reveal the location of the bomb, and uh, it will be possible to prevent um, those millions of deaths, let's say. Okay, so that's the scenario. Well, um, torturing the innocent child uh, clearly would maximize good consequences. And some people believe that that would be the right thing to do, but a lot of people believe that would not be the right thing to do. There's just something intrinsically wrong about torturing uh, an innocent person. Some people, of course, believe that 
torture period is intrinsically wrong even if the person is guilty but um, even more people I'm sure believe that <clears throat> to torture an, an innocent person uh, is in is intrinsically wrong and I think some people would go so far to say that they would not think that it's right no matter how good the consequences no matter how many lives you save so that's an extreme example obviously but it's not hard to think of examples where you could make more people happy by treating one person or maybe an unpopular minority treating them unjustly lots of scenarios in which the majority of people would be happy the minority would be unhappy but because they were treated unjustly but if you were just looking at the scenario from the point of view of maximizing good consequences treating a single individual or a small group of people unjustly would seem to be justified but I think in a lot of cases of that kind that you could think of a lot of people would say no I would not be willing to do that it's just intrinsically wrong <clears throat> what if it could be shown that uh, a society having slavery let's say having it arranged a certain way <clears throat> would have the consequence that 90% of the population would be happy only 10% of the population those who are stuck in the status of slaves would be unhappy let's say 90% um, forcing 10% of the population to do all of the uh, all of the unpleasant labor and so forth would make 90% of the population happy okay well the good consequences would outweigh the bad consequences but I think uh, a lot of people would say that it's still wrong it's still wrong because the slavery is unjust and no amount of good consequences could um, <clears throat> uh, could justify uh, that unjust treatment uh, of anyone <clears throat> so it's not that hard to think of uh, scenarios here again suppose there's a unpopular minority and suppose they're way richer than the rest of the population okay well you could just take away all their money and divide it up among the rest of the population okay suppose that um, they acquired that money um, through perfectly fair legitimate ways um, just by working hard for it um, and by working hard uh, they ended up having far more money than uh, most people the majority of people in that society okay so if utilitarianism requires that we maximize happiness does that mean uh, we should simply uh, dispossess the minority of their wealth take away all their wealth and give it spread it around among the majority let's say 90 percent of the population then would be happy because 90 percent of the population would have more money only 10 percent of the population would be unhappy the 10 percent whose wealth was taken away <clears throat> it seems like <clears throat> utilitarianism clearly requires that we as a society do that and yet i think most people would say <clears throat> that's wrong it's wrong because it's unjust it doesn't matter if the <clears throat> minority is unpopular it doesn't matter <clears throat> if more people could be made happy by taking away their money none of that matters those people have a right to their money they earned it to take it away even on the grounds of maximizing happiness is unjust and no measure of good consequences can make it right I think a lot of people would look at the situation that way as well so it seems like this problem of injustice is a serious problem for utilitarianism <clears throat> all right let's uh, revisit the trolley car thought experiment one more time <clears throat> as I said in the last lecture the original version of it the version um, that I presented in the last lecture was put forward by a utilitarian he thought it was a thought experiment that showed that utilitarianism is clearly correct because the original scenario was <clears throat> here again you're on a trolley car and the brakes fail <clears throat> through no fault of your own you are not responsible for the fact that the brakes fail you just find yourself in that situation there's only enough time to pull a switch that will divert the car onto a sidetrack <clears throat> or not pull a switch that's there's only enough time to do that there are five people ahead of you on the track there isn't enough time to warn them there isn't enough time to alert them there isn't enough time to get them out of the way if you don't pull a switch they will die <clears throat> if you do pull a switch the car will be diverted 
onto a sidetrack. On that sidetrack, there is one workman. So if you pull the switch, only one workman will die. <clears throat> Clearly, there is a course of action that maximizes good consequences. The course of action that maximizes good consequences clearly would be to pull the switch so that only one person would die and five lives would be saved. In that original version of it, most people do agree with what the utilitarian would say, that the right act would be to pull the switch because that way you would minimize bad consequences. <clears throat> um, but is that true? Let's just revise the scenario slightly. Suppose this were the scenario. <clears throat> You're standing on an overpass watching the trolley car speed down the track when you realize that the brakes have failed. There are five workmen on the track ahead and there isn't enough time to alert them. Okay, so far, same as the original version. <clears throat> Next to you, a man who is easily 250 pounds is leaning over the railing of the overpass. Um, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have said that the scenario is the same up to up to that point in the original scenario of course you're on the trolley car so um so this scenario the set the setup is is different you're standing on an overpass now you're not on the trolley car okay so so that is different i take that back it's not exactly the same but it is the same in the sense that um there are five workmen on the track ahead and there isn't enough time to alert them okay now here's a further aspect of the scenario Next to you, a man who is easily 250 pounds is leaning over the railing of the overpass, watching the trolley car speed down the track. It so happens that you are the engineer who designed the trolley, and you know that by throwing an object of 250 pounds into its path, you can stop the trolley. Okay, so in the original version of the thought experiment, as I presented in the last lecture, most people would say, yes, I would pull the switch so that only one person would die. Okay. In this scenario, here again, there's a course of action that you can take that will result in only one person dying instead of five people dying. So again, there clearly is a course of action that would maximize good consequences. And yet, when presented with this version of the scenario, most people say, I would not push a man into in front of the trolley car, killing him in order to save five lives. <clears throat> but here again, in this case, there clearly is a course of action that would minimize bad consequences, namely pushing the guy in front of the, in front of the trolley car. But most people say in this case, I wouldn't do that because that seems to many people to be intrinsically wrong. It's killing an innocent person for the sake of saving the lives of five people. But you could apply that logic to the original version of the scenario as well. By pulling the lever, you were also bringing it about that an innocent person died who otherwise would not die. So it's arguably the case that there's no morally relevant difference between these two cases. <clears throat> the, so the trolley car thought experiment to sum up, according to the utilitarian, again, not to go back to the original version of the trolley car thought experiment, according to the utilitarian, not to turn the car onto the track with only one person would clearly be wrong because we are morally responsible for what we allow to happen. So if you don't pull the switch to divide, divert the car onto the sidetrack, then you're responsible for the fact that those people died. Okay, that's what the utilitarian would say. And most people when presented with that scenario say I would, I would pull the switch so that only one person would die rather than five people. Okay, but now let's think about, let's sum up the revised trolley car thought experiment. If negative responsibility requires us to turn the car onto the track with only one person, then it requires us to throw the innocent bystander into the path of the car. Here again, utilitarians believe in negative responsibility. That is to, th that is to say, they say if you don't pull a switch, then you're responsible for the fact that five people died. But look, you could say the same thing in this revised scenario, couldn't you? If you don't throw the person in front of the car, then you're responsible for the fact that five people died. But most people presented with this scenario would not agree with that. Most people would not pro push the person in, in, front of the, in, in front of the trolley car. But that's puzzling, is it not? Because it's arguably the case that there is no morally relevant difference between these two cases.
there's no morally relevant difference between the two cases. One is just bringing it about that an innocent one innocent person dies by pulling a switch. The other is just bringing it about that an innocent person dies by pushing him. But the fact that it's only the difference between moving your hand one way and moving your hand the other way, that can't be a morally relevant difference. That can't make a difference to the right or the wrong of the case, can it? And yet, most people would not throw an innocent bystander into the path of a car because they think to do so seems clearly wrong. But then why wasn't it wrong in the first case? Again, to take the course of action that would result in only one person dying. So, as I said in the last lecture, the trolley car thought experiment was a, was a thought experiment put forward by a utilitarian because he thought it showed that utilitarianism is the correct normative theory. Because most people say, I would pull the switch so that only one person would die rather than five. But a criticism of utilitarianism uh, has been made in this way. And the criticism would be, if you simply revise that thought experiment, if you simply change a few of the details, most people say they would not take the course of action that would maximize good consequences because it's intrinsic they see it as intrinsically wrong to kill an innocent person for the sake of saving the lives of five people. So this revised version of the thought experiment calls into question whether the act that maximizes good consequences is always the morally right act. So you'll have to decide for yourself what to think about that.